Okay. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and call the February 28th, 2022 water board meeting to order. Heather, can you start with a roll call? Sure. Todd Williams. Here. Allison Gould. Here. Tom Duster. Here. Scott Holwick. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Uh, Ken Houston. Wes Lowry. Here. Um, Kevin Bowden. Here. Francie Jaffe. Would have called it. She's on. Here. Shows. Okay, there she is. Uh, Jason Elkins. Here. David Bell. Here. And Heather McIntyre is here. Chair, you have a quorum. Great. Thank you, Heather. Um, item three is approval of the previous month's minutes. Um, are there any kind of questions, comments on the January 24th, 2022 meeting minutes? I'm not seeing any. If there are none, we need a, a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Roger uh, moves approval. Is there a second? So moved. Yes. Scott, I could barely uh, hear you there. Second. Okay, I think I heard that as a second by Scott. Um, any further discussion? I'm not seeing any. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, those are approved. Item number four is the water status report. Yes, uh, Chairman. Um, the flow of the St. Brain at Lyons today is 12 CFS with 125 year historic average of 15 CFS. Calling the St. Brain Creek is Highland Reservoir number two, admin 11,642, with a priority date of November 15th, 1881. The call on the main stem of the South Platte River is Pruitt Reservoir. Admin 53,300 with a priority date of December 6, 1995. Ralph Price Reservoir is at an elevation of 6,371.9 feet, down 5,500 acre feet and releasing 23 CFS. Union Reservoir is at an elevation of 25.5 feet, down 2,000 acre feet and releasing six CFS. Statewide snowpack is at 95%. South Platte River Basin snowpack is at 99%, as is the Upper Colorado Basin. And St. Vrain Basin snowpack is at 129% of average. Uh, local reservoir storage is at 65% full, and CBT storage is at 70% full. And then additionally, I wanted to share with you that the 2021 water treatment plant demands we're just under 17,000 acre feet and nearly equal to the 20 year average. So that's all I have, unless you have some questions. All right, are there any questions for Wes on the status water status report? I'm not seeing any, thank you, Wes. Um, Heather, I asked you earlier, but is there any public invited to be heard or um, I guess can any special presentations? You don't have any public invited to be heard. Okay. Um, Ken, is there any agenda revisions or submission of documents? I have none. Okay. With that, we're on to development activity. Um, Wes, are you handling that today? Yes. Uh, the first item before you, item 7A, the notch 66 by watermark final plat. That's a 27.747 acre parcel located north of Highway 66 and west of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. All historic water rights were transferred at time of annexation. The full 27.747 acres are subject to the full requirements of the raw water policy. Notch 66 by watermark final plat will be in compliance with the raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of the 40.428 acre foot deficit at time of uh, final plat approval. Additionally, I would mention that um, this is slated for about a 336 multifamily unit uh, development. 
so it includes about 23 buildings and then there's 10 other uh, I think three-story buildings and um, the plan is for that it's going to be satisfied with cash in lieu and that cash in lieu payment will be prior to the change in the fee uh, expected on March 8th. Okay. Are there any questions on the Notch 66 um, uh, proposal on the water requirement? If not, Wes, we need to get a, a recommendation for approval um, to the city council. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So unless there's any questions, does one of the board members make want to make a recommendation of um, the not 66 um, project anyone so moved yeah so tom I made the recommendation allison you want to do the second yes please okay there's a motion and a second any further discussion i'm not seeing any all those in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. That one um, is recommended for approval by the council. Wes, you want to go on to the next? Yes, the next item 7B, uh, Bacon Subdivision Replat B, which is a 0.44 acre parcel located north of Donovan Drive and west of Sunset Street. There were no uh, historic water rights pertinent to this particular property. Um, the full 0.44 acres are subject to the full requirements of the raw water policy. Uh, Bacon subdivision replat B will be in compliance with the raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of the 1.32 acre foot deficit at time of final plat or of, of platting. Uh, this is a subdivision um, of an existing lot into three lots. Um, and, and this one also, we're expecting to see a payment for cash in lieu prior to March 8th. Okay. Are there any questions on the Bacon subdivision replat B for Wes? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, so this is more like a general question, perhaps. Maybe I should have asked it on the last one as well, but I'm just curious as to whether uh, we've or whether the city's had any interactions with. Uh, kind of individuals or, or, you know, entities of some variety that we know are kind of in the pipeline about the new, um, the new cash and lieu um, uh, policy and, and whether kind of what the reaction has been to that and whether people are kind of expediting their processes to try to get in before that March 8th deadline or, or, or just kind of any, any insights into that is at all. So yes, um, we've had, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different developers that are in the development process. I've had conversations with developers that aren't yet even in the development process that are thinking about getting into the process. So um, as you may recall, the raw water requirement policy affords um, any land that was annexed to satisfy all remaining uh, deficits pertinent to that annexation at any time following annexation. So for example, you might have a 100 acre annexation and then maybe you've had three separate 10 acre plattings, which gives a remaining 70 acres. And even though there may not be a plat as part of the existing 70 acres, somewhat anyone can go in there and satisfy that full remaining 70 acres. Um, that doesn't normally occur, but we're seeing that occur now as a, as a result of the upcoming increase for fee for cash and lieu. Sometimes um, historic water rights are nearly sufficient to satisfy the full three acre fee per acre deficit. And I've had experience where the uh, owner of the property has satisfied the full three acre feet just to be done with it and made it easier for him to market to know that it was all done and he locked in his cash and loose. So, so basically the reaction has been very supportive. They've been appreciative that we've been reach, tr doing our best to try to let them know above and beyond what's already been out there in the public. 
Um, the uh, we're seeing quite a bit of, uh, as you mentioned, expedited uh, satisfaction. I think in the uh, last two weeks, I've processed about eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars in cash and lieu payments. There's we're expecting more to be coming in in the next week, and so none of that's really that surprising. But it, overall, I think it's been people that have. I guess waiting. So typically what developers we find, one of the last things they'll do as part of their subdivision or platting process is to satisfy raw water deficits. And that's that happens for a number of reasons. One is if they were to transfer non-historic water rights as allowed by the policy, they if they get transferred to Longmont, they can't be transferred back out. They can't be sold without a vote of the people. And so it's just naturally where most people want to be sure it's the last thing that they do. And so sometimes people will have their plat nearly finished, but for whatever reason, they haven't, they're not ready to make that final step. And it can sit in the DRC process for months, if not years. And I think there's about a two year maximum limit, but, um, we're finding that there are some of those individuals as well that are coming through right now and satisfying their deficits. They were identified last year by water board as their deficit. And, and now with the knowledge they've been given, they're coming in and satisfying their, their deficits. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Wes on the, um, uh, the bacon water analysis and welcome Marsha welcome to the meeting um, so if there are no other questions we need a recommendation um, of approval of the bacon subdivision replat b water calculation to the council does someone want to make that motion it looks like Allison is going to make the motion is there a second Rogers the second any further discussion I'm not seeing any all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, it carries. Um, so is that all, Wes? That was the end of the um, development activity? That was all. Okay, thank you. Um, on to, is there anything under item eight, the general business? Uh, Ken's shaking his head, so no. On to item nine, 9A is the annual Button Rock Preserve update. Um, welcome, Price, good to see you. I assume you'll be the one kind of walking us through this. Yep. And Heather, are you gonna be running the PowerPoint for me or do I do that? Looks like you are, great. Welcome everybody. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to update you all on happenings at Button Rock Preserve. Uh, my name is Price Hadley. For those of you who haven't met me before, I'm the Senior Watershed Ranger at Button Rock. Um, we recently got satellite internet, so can everybody hear me okay? All right, good. That's a huge improvement. Um, so next slide. So today I just wanna give you a quick overview of uh, the past year at Button Rock, talk to you about the kind of the new normal that we're experiencing um, in the latter days of COVID give you an update on ranger activity at the preserve, and then talk about forestry projects, uh, some infrastructure and maintenance backlog that we've been working on, talk a little bit about visitor safety, and give you a preview of some outreach and education efforts that we're planning for the new year. Next slide. So unsurprisingly, COVID has continued to impact our management and our experience up here at Button Rock. Um, as with the last, uh, really the last 20 months or so, um, COVID has impacted the types of programs and, and activities we've been able to offer at Button Rock. The Boulder County Youth Corps season was canceled for the second year in a row. Um, we've had infrastructure projects delayed due to supply chain issues, just like everything else. Um, every other aspect of city government, we've felt that pinch as well, which has required us to do some creative problem solving. And luckily we've found a way to get most of what we 
set out to do done in 2021. In uh, the last year, we hosted over 58,000 visitors, which uh, was 19% lower than 2020, but still busier than any year prior to COVID. Uh, on the chart on the right side of the slide, you can see there's a, the colors aren't great, but the brown line is our average from 2019 to 2021. And the gray line is 2021. So you can see that even in 2021, we still outpaced the prior average. Um, we only exceeded visitation of 2020 in the fall um, because in 2020, fall 2020, we obviously were experiencing the Calwood fire and had a closure. So overall, we've had less crowding in the preserve, which is nice. That's also led to fewer parking issues, fewer complaints from our residents in the Longmont Dam neighborhood, which is always a good sign. Um, and generally uh, pretty good compliance. Next slide. So part of that um, equation has definitely been an increase in ranger presence. We currently have two full-time rangers stationed at Button Rock and one seasonal ranger. You can see some photos of us in action on the right side of the slide. Um, overall, we've had good compliance relative to visitation. You know, as I said, we had about 60,000 visitors Rangers um, patrol the preserve every day. Um, we issued, um, well, we had more than 330 enforcement contacts. So anytime we're talking to somebody about a rules violation, gathering their information, that kind of thing. Um, we're overall very educationally focused. We issued 310 warnings. Um, we issued one summons, 20 parking tickets, which were really pretty much all took place right at, in the span of a couple of weeks. And then we were able to dial in some signage issues down at the parking lot and have had very few issues since, which is great. We checked over 195 fishing permits with fantastic compliance from our anglers. Um, we made dozens of citizen assists, resident contacts, and uh, naturalist kind of educational contacts types of data that we track. Next slide. In addition to all that, rangers responded to 18 emergencies in the Button Rock area. Uh, some notable calls included uh, stranded hikers that we assisted across the river with help from Lions Fire in April during high water. Um, in June, we had a ranger assist search and rescue in the sheriff's office with an evacuation of a injured equestrian in Colson Gulch, which is the Forest Service property to our west. Um, we've had multiple search and rescues, including one where three missing hikers were found by a ranger. Um, you can see the photo on the right from a small wildfire that uh, myself and our seasonal ranger, Connor O'Reilly, uh, were able to contain that we had located in Colson Gulch, again, just outside our west boundary. And we conducted a park evacuation of the public, of visitors, uh, during the Kruger Rock fire. Next slide. So in 2021, despite COVID, we were able to make some headway on a number of projects, including forestry work, uh, maintenance, infrastructure, some visitor safety initiatives, and outreach and education efforts. Next slide. So forestry, obviously a big part of our job as watershed rangers is implementing the 2017 Forest Stewardship Plan. In 2021, we wrapped up the log jam project, which was a uh, forest restoration and fuels reduction cut on the west side of the property. We removed about 500 trees through a contractor. I was able to give 300 of those trees to Boulder County to use in the aerial mulching efforts on the Calwood burn scar, which was kind of a cool way to use that carbon close to us for a good restoration purpose. Uh, we followed up that project with volunteer seed collection uh, on the preserve to collect native seeds. And then we spread those seeds in disturbed areas in the log jam area. Uh, we're currently in the planning phase for another grant funded forestry project like log jam. We secured a furworm grant from the state. Um, and I'm currently working with Boulder County on a cross boundary forestry treatment that'll take place in the Sleepy Lion Trail area, calling it the Antelope Park Project. So in order to do that cross boundary work, we have to get a formal access agreement in place, do the RFP process to secure a contractor. So I'm currently working through the kind of intergovernmental plan that's 
uh, required to pull something off like that. Um, related to all this is the city's continued involvement in the St. Green Forest Health Partnership, which is an intergovernmental, um, kind of interdisciplinary coalition of, of agencies, nonprofits, community groups, citizens um, that to help protect the St. Green watershed and improve forest health. Um, the city recently contributed $134,000 to Calwood fire recovery efforts, um, which was the a matching amount with the um, safe, uh, the St. Brain Left Hand Water Conservancy Districts. We each contribute equal parts to uh, pay for that effort in protecting and improving the burned area. Um, Button Rock also was the site of a field trip from the St. Brain Forest Health Partnership where they toured our property and um, basically discussed uh, forestry best management practices and desired future outcomes. Uh, and all of that is super valuable as it informs planning for projects like the Antelope Park cut. You can see in the picture on the right is the log jam cut. Um, that was last spring. You can see some uh, piles there and what the area looks like after it's thinned. Uh, in our financial table, there you go, there's the picture. And on the financial table, you can see that we continue to effectively leverage grant funding to complete forestry work on the preserve. Um, since forestry efforts were started, since they were tracked uh, in 2004, we've treated about one third the land mass of Button Rock. Um, and we've done that with about 50% of the cost being covered by grant dollars. So very effective leveraging of, of grants. And we're continuing that into the future with the Antelope Park grant and uh, additional grants being um, considered. Next slide. So Antelope Park project, you can see on this map, our, on our planning map here, we've got four units. Uh, there's three turquoise polygons and a yellow polygon on there. Just to give you a visual of where we'll be working in the new year. Um, this cut is gonna be focused on uh, uh, reducing meadow encroachment around Sleepy Lion Trail, um, reducing the basal area, the, the thickness of the forest um, on our boundary with Paul Ranch to uh, really uh, get to the point where it's a, a more natural um, distribution of age class of trees um, and also uh, a comp forest composition that will hopefully keep fire on the ground if a wildfire did come through the area as opposed to you know, like the catastrophic crown fires that you've seen in the media or in person. Um, and we're working closely with our partners at Boulder County Parks and Open Space to accomplish that, as well as with Left Hand Watershed Center, we'll be conducting an outreach and education campaign kicking off in about a month to really front load and educate our visitors about why we are doing this thinning and how it helps protect the forest and most importantly, protect our drinking water. Next slide. So we've been dealing with a bit of a maintenance backlog at Button Rock. Um, COVID hasn't really helped that, but um, luckily we've had a lot of support from the city and increased staffing at the preserve. Um, we've been able to really make some headway. Uh, I was able to apply funds that had been intended for Boulder County Youth Corps when that season was canceled to um, address some of these uh, maintenance issues. If you click once, it should switch. So this is, the, this is Button Rock Dam before our backlog of maintenance was addressed. And this is what it looks like after a haircut. Obviously, we, you know, try to keep our infrastructure, um, you know, clear of woody vegetation, prevent any damage to it. Um, so that was one large project that we worked on was clearing all woody vegetation from the dam face um, to protect that structure. We also treated invasive species along our main fire road. Um, removed some hazmat that we'd found in different, in different structures on the preserve. Uh, we've worked to establish defensible space around preserve facilities, and I drafted a facilities management plan to make sure that a lot of these issues don't end up on the back burner and we continue to be proactive and taking care of them. And last, I'll just point out that we did, we recently towed and removed the debris boom from Ralph Price Reservoir that for those of you who are involved in water board, We'll remember um, that that was placed there after the 2013 flood. Um, so that was no small effort, but we've got that debris boom off the water and we've salvaged it and stored it at 
Nelson Flanders. So if we need to redeploy it in the future, we can. Next slide. So as part of our maintenance backlog, we've worked to uh, maintain and protect our infrastructure um, so that they're sustainable going forward. Uh, we addressed a variety of unsafe conditions in the uh, ranger residence and in the ranger station, including radon, asbestos, and bolt structures, uh, and a lack of water and heat in the ranger residence, which we've now corrected and much more lovable. Um, ranger Miles Churchill is living currently at the preserve. Um, we converted the lower ranger residence, which some of you may be familiar with, down here by the spillway, to a functioning ranger station. So we now have access to bathroom, heat, um, you know, internet, those basic necessities for um, doing our work on site. Um, we upgraded a radio tower on, on the property, replaced the outlet tunnel uh, vent fan, which had failed as original to the 1960s, um, conducted a risk review with our risk department and assigned confined spaces. And we also, the Rangers operated pumps 24 seven during last CBT shutdown in 2021 uh, in order to provide drinking water to the public. Next slide. In addition to kind of the infrastructure, the built environment, we also worked on improving visitor safety. Um, we uh, published the new Button Rock Dam EAP, Emergency Action Plan. We upgraded our public safety radio system for the Rangers. So now Rangers for the first time are able to talk to Longmont Dispatch directly, which is a huge asset to us. We improved our safety signage, um, including um, some signage around our outlet pool where the water comes out at the base of the dam. Uh, we dramatically improved our parking compliance with some additional signage, um, uh, installed some pop-up parking signage when we've got high traffic days, removed hazard trees, worked with volunteers to close some social trails. You see the buck and rail fence in the upper right that people were going down this gully and getting stuck next to the creek, resulting in probably about a half dozen search and rescue missions over the span of a year. And we've not had a single issue since we built that fence. Um, and we also uh, invested in improved wildfire training and equipment for the Ranger crew. Next slide. Finally, I just wanna give you a little bit of info on some outreach and volunteer efforts that we've been doing at the preserve. Uh, the city recently hired a volunteer coordinator to help us stay organized and recruit volunteers. Uh, even before she was hired, Taylor Gifford is our new volunteer coordinator. She's great. Um, we had 12 volunteer work days at the preserve, uh, which accomplished social trail closure that I mentioned earlier, um, pulling, um, fencing, uh, collecting native seeds, and picking up trash at McCall Lake. Um, I worked with a translator and with our branding and marketing department to produce Spanish and English brochures that are stocked at the preserve and include a hiking map as well as historical and natural history information about the about Button Rock area and regulation information. Uh, and we are working with the Left Hand Watershed Center to plan the forest health education campaign that I mentioned earlier. Next slide. So here's my requisite slide of critters from 2021 uh, highlights. Uh, we've got our, uh, I think technically this bobcat is from 2022, but a bobcat that I encountered at a distance of about 15 feet uh, at the Button Rock Trailhead, um, who was eating a roadkill deer. So that was definitely a top wildlife experience of my time as a ranger. And then a black bear from the Chimney Rock area. So it continues to be an excellent uh, hidden gem up here at Button Rock, despite some a little bit more popularity. Next slide. So yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to speak to anything in the presentation or answer any um, questions you may have. Great, thank you, Price. Um, looks like Allison has a question, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Price. Really love the pictures as always. Um, was that mountain lion also up there? The mountain lion was, that photo was taken by a regular visitor to Button Rock who's a wildlife photographer, but that lion was actually at Rabbit Mountain. But I was looking for a, a nearby lion photo for our pamphlet when it talks about the different animal species you may encounter. And Jane was 
was kind enough to offer us use of that photo. But yeah, she encountered that lion on the Eagle Wind Trail over in Boulder County open cool. space. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, one uh, topical question. Where were those 300 trees processed? So the 300 trees that were hauled off of the log jam cut were trucked to Heil, uh, Heil Valley Ranch on Gear Canyon Road. And the county had a contractor there that was processing the wood on site, turning it into uh, mulch, wood mulch, wood straw. And then they would load it into the helicopters and follow GPS and drop it on various prioritized units in the burn scar. In the burn scar. Cool. Thank you. Are there other questions for Price? Um, I do have one, Price. In, in terms of the, I guess, the overall drainage, how much, I know you're working on a lot of private lands. Is there quite a bit of public forest service lands as well that are um, ultimately would have be within the drainage of Ralph Price? Um, so the drainage expanding up to Allen's Park and Wild Basin, I mean, really you're, you're kind of encapsulating everything from Rocky Mountain National Park through some limited private holdings up, up in the Allen's Park area as you cross Highway 7. Um, but I mean, it's fairly limited what's upstream of us in terms of private property. I mean, we have the Park Service and then um, a very a large swath of, of Forest Service property in, in a Boulder County roadless area as you come in from Larimer, um, draining into Ralph Price. Um, in the preserve, you know, it's 3,000 acres of city land surrounded by many thousands of acres of the Rapaho Roosevelt National Forest. We border two large holdings from Boulder County Parks and Open Space, um, primarily the Hall Ranch and Riverside open space, uh, as well as many other smaller parcels. And we've got about I think, nine private properties. Um, so it's predominantly public land, um, which is definitely an asset to us when we look at landscape scale planning for forestry and watershed protection. I guess the reason I ask Price is I know the, the Northern District is doing work on the East Troublesome Fire. And there has been, the Forest Service has been getting funds to do more, I think, forest management as well as obviously kind of mitigation from the East Troublesome Fire. So I, I, you guys have done an amazing job on the grants. I just didn't know if there'd be a way to maybe leverage some of that money coming to the Forest Service for um, maybe management projects um, uh, if there's areas of concern. So just was, that was kind of the reason I was going there. Yeah, there's a pot of money called, I think it's adjacent lands treatments or something along those lines that is open to uh, local government that I was talking recently with the State Forest Service about. Um, so any of our parcels, which is, you know, any of our parcels that border forest service land that we're doing forestry work on could be eligible for those funds, which is virtually everything. Um, and then there's also a large amount of state funding in COSWAP, the Colorado, I think it's strategic wildfire. Um, I'm not sure if the full acronym is, but COSWAP is, is distributing funds. Maybe Ken can speak to the full acronym, but we're, we have that on our radar, um, both in terms of additional work we can do with uh, youth cores. I've, I've got a partnership that I'm working on with Larimer County Conservation Corps' uh, Sawyer crew. It's a young adult Sawyer's in, probably in their 20s, college age. Um, there's some state funding that I can get to offset those costs, as well as some larger grant dollars that um, we're looking at with in conjunction with partner agencies. Okay, great. Well, you guys do amazing jobs. So I'm always impressed on how much you're able to raise in terms of grant funding. So thanks for that. Any other questions or comments? Um, I guess maybe the only, the last question I've got is on, I know we had discussions on, I know you've mentioned the violations. Is that, assume that's going better um, since you guys had first enacted it. Can you give us an update on that? Uh, can you, so you're just talking about general code violations or? Yeah, I think it was question? multiple uh, dogs mindset. and they were off leash and yeah. resulting in waste issues and other problems. I mean, I would say based on, you know, I've, I've been a ranger for seven and a half years and based on my experience in, in my previous park system, our compliance is much better here, much more uh, 
polite and easy to work with population. I'd also say um, knowing that Boulder County averages about an 80% compliance rate, um, you know, I'd say that we're at least something along those lines, which is great. Um, you know, we have really good compliance with the one dog per visitor regulation that was implemented several years ago. Um, you know, we have pretty good, could be better compliance with our leash law. Um, that said, it has, it has improved in the time that I've been here um, with greater ranger presence and, you know, we can further improve it through, um, you know, the use of ticketing if we have to. But I think that overall the compliance is, is very good compared to other, um, you know, open space or nature preserve type, um, you know, lands that you encounter throughout the state. Great. And our fishing Thanks. compliance is excellent, which is great. Good. Okay. Anything else for price? I'm not saying anything. Thank you very much for the update. It's always um, fun to hear about all the work you guys are doing. You got a lot on your plate, so thank you. Thank you. So with that, we'll go on to item 9B, which is a water resource engineering projects update. Jason. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to give everybody an update on uh, some of our major uh, capital projects. So the South St. Vrain Pipeline Rehab Project uh, I know I've been talking about that one in a lot of meetings lately. So we're, um, we've are we issued a substantial completion for that. We've just got some punch list items that we have to do. But basically, um, you know, the South St. Rain pipeline is um, going to be full, uh, capable of delivering water to the Highland Ditch um, by the end of this week. We just have to remove some um, uh, sediment deposits on the east end of the pipeline. Um, but... Uh, by Friday, we should be able to um, actually deliver water if we needed to. Having said that, we probably won't be doing that because we're starting to kick off the South St. Rain Pipeline um, uh, pump station project. And so I just issued notice to proceed to glacier construction uh, on that project last week. And they're currently starting um, to get prepared uh, to mobilize. They've called in for locates. Uh, they're doing some uh, preliminary surveying work. And um, they're planning on being on site uh, at the end of this week, and um, they'll be they'll be kicking that off. And they actually anticipate uh, uh, being able to uh, finish construction uh, a, a few weeks ahead of what we had estimated. So, um, still working out some of the details on the uh, construction schedule, but uh, overall, um, we're fairly confident that we're going to have this uh, pipeline up and running um, by by summer. Um, you know. June, uh, June, July, it depends on a lot of things, but uh, um, assuming everything goes according to plan and no unforeseen um, supply chain issues and stuff like that, knock on wood, which we don't anticipate, but um, we're, we're anticipating um, having that pump station online, you know, in uh, June, June, July timeframe. Um, so the North St. Vrain uh, pipeline um, feasibility study that we're doing with Dewberry engineers um, we've done the SES uh, evaluation, that's the sustainability evaluation system. And so we had um, uh, seven or eight participants in that uh, from all different departments. Uh, we even had a lot of uh, auditors, um, just people just kind of viewing, watching us go through the evaluation process. And so um, Francie Jaffe, actually, she was the uh, uh, facilitator for that one, and she led the team in that. And so uh, we've finalized the report on that. And that that SES tool will be, or the, the results of that SES tool will be um, incorporated into the study. And so we're anticipating having that study finalized in the next uh, couple months. Um, you know, we've, we're getting pretty into the weeds now into the study. And so things are dragging out a little bit longer than anticipated. Having said that, we've, I, I, you know, uh, quality over quantity. I'd, I'd rather, you know, spend a, a couple extra weeks uh, going over some of these details with the fine tooth comb as opposed to try to rush them. So, um, so anyway, we, we hope to have that ready um, probably this spring. And uh, as soon as I do have that uh, um, uh, in draft form, uh, I'll forward it to forward it to the board for review and for comment as well. And then um, one of the projects that I inherited from uh, Larry Wayno, uh, he recently retired um, from engineering services um, as part of our 1041 permit with Boulder County on the North St. Vrain pipeline replacement project along Apple Valley Road is there's two abandoned segments of uh, North St. Vrain pipeline still in the creek. Um, 
it's it's not actually in the creek, it's below the creek, but they're they're crossing the creek. And as part of our 1041 permit, we're required to remove those two pieces of pipeline. Um, and so anyway, I'm working with uh, Nick Excavating Construction and uh, working with the adjacent property owners out there because uh, access to those um, two abandoned pipes, uh, two, aban two, two sections of abandoned pipe are from uh, private residents. And so working with them um, to get access, working with the county to get a stormwater permit, and a, a floodplain permit and stuff like that. So just kind of uh, jumping through some of the hoops now to get the permitting uh, in place, but we're hoping to have that done before spring runoff. Um, and to minimize the impact to those residents, the town of Lyons also has their water line that runs uh, adjacent to ours and they're also required to remove theirs. So um, being good neighbors and good stewards, just trying to help everybody out. We're gonna remove the town of Lyons pipeline as well um, as part of our project so that the town doesn't have to come back in, you know, at a later date and, and disrupt, you know, those residents um, and, and damage their property. So um, it's double the workload, but it's not really a big deal. It's just a little bit more paperwork and a little bit more oversight. Uh, but the town of Lyons is uh, participating financially while the city of Longmont um, leads in the in the construction and design in that. So, but that's what I have for the board. Is there any questions? Great, thank you, Jason. Any questions for Jason? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. Good update. Thank you. All right, we're on to item 9C, which is an update on council initiatives. Ken? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we just have a, a few items that um, will affect over time the water board that I wanted to talk about. Um, the first one is that um, council is still um, meeting remotely, but they're having conversations about when they'll go back to in person. And Marsha may be able to <laughs> tell me better, uh, but I, I believe like late March time frame, early April at the latest. I would think so, Ken. Yeah, um, I uh, am at a little bit of a disadvantage because we're not getting the case rates. You know what we sort of voted on last time was was uh, we'd like to see it get down below the uh, the red level again. Remember those old levels that we used to have? And um, we've been so far above those. So I don't know where we are with respect to those old lines, but I think once we get down below them, we'll definitely go back in person if the council is even willing to wait that long. Yeah. So it could be early March. Okay. So, um, in that vein, um, we didn't want to just arbitrarily say, okay, they, you know, we're going back in person on the, on the water board. Just wanted to see if the board is interested in having a conversation today about either the March meeting or the April meeting, if you want to go back in person or continue remote. Um, just really kind of wanted to, to hear from the board on what your, your thoughts are. Any comments from the board? I guess, oh, go ahead, Roger. Ken, is there any criteria along with where, what Mar Marsha was talking about as far as levels of activity or inactivity that would lead us one direction or another, or is it our decision to make by ourselves? Well, at, at this point, it really is water board's decision because um, the, if you think about it, the real, um, just the real cr statistical kind of crunch point was when Boulder County removed um, the mask mandate for uh, indoors. So that was kind of the last little thread out there hanging. Um, but we didn't want to take that and run with it in February, even though it is now lifted. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's, you could certainly follow similar to what uh, council's doing. You know, there was a, a low transmission level, uh, uh, I'll call it a medium yellow transmission level, and then there was a red transmission level. And last I looked, we were just kind of about to break below the top of the red transmission level. Um, but I have to admit, I haven't looked the last week. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that could be another criteria. But I would say technically it was when Boulder County lifted the mass mandate. Um, and so 
uh, either of those would be good good criteria to use. Yeah, I, one last comment, and you know, it's these work out pretty well at remote, but I do miss uh, getting together uh, as a group live. So I I would be in favor of doing it. You know, maybe we could target March, but anyway, that's just my opinion. Thanks, Roger. Any other comments? Um, I'm in line with Roger. If now that the mask main mandate by Boulder County has been pulled, if we can get back in person, that'd be my preference. Um, so that's just where I'm at. I don't know, Allison or Tom, if you guys want to weigh in on it, or Scott, if you can hear us. Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Scott. I, I can hear you fine, and I'm in favor of uh, meeting live in person if possible. I'm Allison. Also Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'm also of that opinion. Um, at some point, we had discussed the ability to participate virtually if possible. I would like that to still be an option um, if, for example, someone's feeling a little under the weather and they don't want to expose anyone, or if someone in their family is feeling under the weather. Um, I think that that would be great to have that option. Yes, as, as you may recall, we did. Uh, the board did change your um, rule, your board rules, um, uh, to allow that. So that wouldn't be a problem. Perfect. Then I am in favor of going back in March. <laughs> yeah, and Todd, I, I would also be in favor of going back in March. Um, seems like things are opening up a little bit, and so. It, it makes sense. Uh, I, I will continue to be a, a mask wearer. So if everybody can uh, put up with that, that's okay. But um, so, uh, but, but other than that, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to see you all in person again. So. Great. Well, thanks everybody. Does that get you what you need, Kim? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. And, and then again, if, if you can indulge staff, if something comes up, we, we, none of us know. <laughs> Some does come up. We, we, you know, we may, on a case by case basis, switch back to a remote, and we'll let the board know that. But right now, we'll plan on uh, in person beginning in March. So thank you very much. Um, the second uh, subject, and and I'm only uh, bringing this up to inform the board that we'll start this process, but because we have not had a chance to, uh, it, it's gonna take a little bit of work for, for staff to be ready to bring this forward to uh, Water Board. But um, when we were taking some of our earlier um, cash and lieu information to council, uh, the council had asked us uh, to work with Water Board um, about the attainable housing, uh, the possibility of having some attainable housing uh, uh, incentives relative to cash and lieu, similar to what we have for affordable housing and commercial in, uh, incentive. So right now um, we have in the code language for um, commercial development incentive, and we have language in the code for affordable housing incentive. Um, and council has been working uh, uh, more recently on uh, attainable housing, which, which is a great um, uh, area to, to look at as well. And so we've been asked to kind of look at how we do the other two programs and see if it fits uh, in the attainable housing program and how we might implement it and how it might um, you know, impact the other two programs, all, all those kind of things. So we have reached out to the uh, uh, planning department. And, and of course, the first thing I ask them is, Give me a good definition of attainable housing, <laughs> and and they're they're working on that. I think there is some language in the code, but uh, as I understand, they're they're working on that um, to better define what we want. And then, of course, I would presume that's what we would use if we were to to look at it from a water supply standpoint. But um, and so, yeah, Marsha, if you can add anything, that'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, well, the housing and urban development definition uh, of attainable housing is is that uh, if if a person or a family owning uh, earning between eighty percent 
and 120% of the area median income, can afford the mortgage, can qualify for the mortgage, it's attainable, um, which means essentially that there's none <laughs> in, in, in Longmont right now. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't tell you a lot because the complication, the definition of, of area median income is also complicated. But, you know, in terms of, if you just think of that as average for a household, that depends on the size of the household, then you're close. So, um, yeah, as you can see, for us, us water folks, we're, <laughs> we're, that's really getting, getting out of our, our, our arena. But um, no, we, we want to, uh, you know, we want to start bringing that forward and start talking about that. Um, and I will, we'll be able in the future to be able to bring you more information exactly like that and start talking it through. Um, and, and honestly, this is a slightly bigger area to, to wrap our hands around and, and figure out policy. And it certainly will require probably review and, and, and recommendations by water board but then going to council and talking some of the policy issues and coming back and, you know, I would expect we would refine it uh, a, a number of times uh, to, to get to wherever we're going to be. So haven't even, we haven't even started working on it. So, so don't want, didn't want to, uh, you know, overly complicate anything at this point, but just did want to, you know, throw it out there, let you think about it. Um, it'll, it'll probably be something we'll be working at in the future, although not immediate future, because we want to work with uh, our planning department to make sure we're um, compatible and, and understand where they're going with that as well. So just a heads up. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, Ken, I, I have a question. So sure. uh, uh, first of all, thank, thank you for the update. I, I think this um, goes away is at least towards addressing some of the, some of the things that I'd brought up in the past about maybe hopefully being able to use kind of, you know, our, our, our standing in terms of, you know, a pretty good water portfolio and a good standing, you know, to be able to do kind of positive change, you know, some kind of positive change here in the, in the community. Um, so I, I'm happy to, to kind of engage with this particular one. I think this is good. Um, one piece of information that I may want and request very early on to, to so you know in the initial planning phases here it would be helpful to know is maybe if you could I don't know somehow I'm just thinking perhaps you could reach out to a developer or somebody that you that you know that you could ask a question to to basically say okay well you know what percentage of a house or the housing let's say housing um is kind of the water costs in some way that we could make a difference, right? So in other words, you know, can we, can we help bring the cost of a house down by 1% or can we help bring the cost of a house down by 0.00001%, right? Those are two big differences. So, um, and, and then, you know, and then kind of, we can start brainstorming about ways that maybe we could, we could help in that fashion, I guess, but. Okay, yeah, we'd be happy to bring that. That I appreciate you letting us know you want that information because certainly we we understand the density. You know, we are developing uh, slightly more densely, uh, which which is good. But that means the actual when you spread the water over more units, it's less of an impact per unit. So, yeah, we'll we'll try to get that information as part of this. Are there any other questions or comments on that? I, I do have a comment, Ken, but I'm gonna wait until we get to the informational items, um, just on the write-up um, overall that was presented to council and just a couple of comments there. So okay. we can keep moving along and then I'll, I'll give you a few thoughts at that point. Okay, and then I think Allison had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Allison, do you wanna, did you have some? Yeah, uh, kind of a, a similar to Tom's thoughts. Uh, one thing that we had discussed, and I apologize if this has been already kind of resolved, is how much area is actually still subject to this process? Um, you know, is it 
five acres? Is it 250 acres? Um, I mean, it would help us kind of understand what type of a spread we're looking at. So that would be one of the threshold questions that I would like to think about as a part of this question. And then as kind of a subset of that question, which one of, if any of these acres are actually zoned for residential and would be subject to the uh, um, attainable housing um, uh, categorization. So it would help kind of understand the scope of the issue um, as far as kind of what we're looking at and, and then um, get into Tom's questions as far as like what would actually make an appreciable difference. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, we had similar, some, a little bit of similar information in the cash and list information. So we'll certainly plan on including that as well. That's a good point. We'll do. Great. Thank you. Anything okay. else? Cool. Yes. Um, the third thing I wanted to talk about real quickly was um, our schedule of water board meetings. Um, currently, we're scheduled the fourth. Tuesday uh, or fourth third, Monday third, of third Monday. Jan January and February, and then the uh, third Monday, the remainder of the year. Um, I believe council is taking up uh, the possibility of having Juneteenth as a holiday. And I'm not sure if that'll be actually on Juneteenth day or, or, or if it going to be the third, it might be the third, I believe on the federal calendar, it's the third Monday. It usually gets ended up on the, on the on Monday because then people have a three-day weekend. <laughs> so, um, I, and, and I, I don't know, Marsha, I might, <laughs> sorry to, to keep bugging you, but do you know where council is on, uh, I, I thought that might even be voted on next Tuesday or is that coming up? Tuesday is a study session and we voted on it. Is it a first reading already? I can't remember. Um, there was no dissent. So um, whenever the vote happens, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be passed and, uh, and it'll be a Monday holiday. Uh, but it's not this coming Tuesday because that's a study session. Yeah, it's, it's scheduled to come to you on the regular session at um, March 8th. Thank you, Heather. Um, so, so basically, what, what what we were wondering is, you know, um, uh, do you, do you want to continue to kind of keep chipping away and having different Mondays? <laughs> uh, you know, would you like us to look at maybe just going to the fourth Monday year round? Um, what is easiest and best for water board? And there, there is no, you know, we don't need to make a decision today, but we will need to, you know, or we may want to consider it before for June. Uh, and, or we may want to consider uh, in the next couple of months, uh, resetting the June meeting till the fourth meeting as we do in uh, January and February. So staff is staff is open to whatever water board wants to do. I just wanted to let you know that that, you know, might um, affect how you want to schedule your board meetings. So. All right. Is there any kind of thoughts on that? It seems to me if we, if you adjust it to the fourth, there's probably going to be conflicts there too. So at some point, maybe you stay with the third and then adjust as necessary it would be kind of what my gut's telling me, but if anybody else has another idea, that's I'm open to that as well. Marcia, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say that uh, the fourth Monday for me is is uh, beneficial electrification for quite a few months. I don't know. Um, I don't think anybody else is on that, but you know, I'm, I'm a secondary consideration, but I thought I'd let you know. Okay. Any other comments? Roger? I've kind of worked in on a third Monday schedule and uh, my preference would be to stay with it unless there's a reason to have an exception okay. during any one month. So that, that's just my preference. Yeah, and I'm on the same page. Everybody else, is that okay for now for everybody? 
Okay. Yes, Todd, this is Scott, and I'm in the same place as Roger. I've got this baked into my uh, calendar for the third Monday. So okay. let's, I, I prefer to keep it there, too. Sounds good. All right, we'll go that direction then. Do I might have anything add, else, Ken? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I might add that that would be consistent with the board's bylaws. That's what you have stated in your regular meeting section of your bylaws, that it would be the third Monday. But in the event you can't meet on the third Monday, you'll – It'll, it would then go to the fourth Monday. So everything you guys have said would be consistent with your current bylaws. Great. Thanks, Wes. Okay. Ken, anything else? Um, yeah. Then the last item is, um, as you may remember, we uh, staff in our parks department has been working on a Button Rock Preserve uh, master plan, a little more focused on the recreational uh, and, and um, wildlife issues up there. They're still working on that plan and they still um, plan on bringing back a, uh, an actual master plan. Uh, and they had hoped to have it either for the February today or for the March meeting. Um, unfortunately, they, they don't have the actual uh, master plan, the written document done yet by the consultant. And so they, they've asked uh, to, to postpone the meeting. Might be able to have it at the March uh, meeting, but I, they can't guarantee us. So they were wondering if the, the water board um, would be amenable to having a uh, special meeting called uh, just for the purpose of uh, looking at that uh, master plan. And if, if it couldn't make it to the um, March meeting, it would probably be around the first week of April uh, when that would happen. Uh, if, if they don't get it fairly soon, it'll probably be the actual April meeting, which actually turns out to be one day before they plan, they're scheduled to take it to city council. They were just hoping to get it maybe a week before that um, so they could get any input back from the board and uh, report that. But um, so I told him I, all I do is ask the board <laughs> to see if, if you were had any interest in, in having you know a, a special meeting in between the two regular meetings of March and April, or if you want to just uh, wait and do that at the April board meeting. Okay. Any thoughts? Um, I guess Ken, my my guess, tell me if we obviously they get it done before the March meeting, would that be plenty of time? And even if they get it done in April, you'd still have a week before you'd have to go. You may not be able to include it in your write up, but you, it seems like it could be part of the staff presentation, couldn't it? Yeah, it could. We, and we've done that before. We've had action taken on Monday, and then the next day at council, you know, verbally report the board's uh, action right. and input. So That'd be my preference to just include it with one of the board meetings unless somebody wants to have a special meeting to discuss it. All right, I don't see anybody wanting to chime in beyond that. So I would just go that route. Um, Ken, hopefully they can get it done. We can talk about it in March and have plenty of time. Otherwise we'll visit about it in April. Yeah, and, and they do know, I mean, even though the report isn't written, they do know the code changes that they're gonna propose to council. And they, we do plan on bringing those code changes. So it's almost like we know the answer. We don't have the report, but we know the answers. <laughs> and, and so I, I think we can still bring those to Waterboard at the March meeting. So you have a, a feel for what those will look like. Uh, we just won't have the document to back it up. <laughs> and we'll tell you what, it, what the backup is, though. So. Okay, great. Thank, great, thank you. you. And that's all I have. All right. So we're done with um, nine, we're on to um, item 10. Items from the board, we have the review of the major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Any comments by the board on any of those items? I don't see any. Um, item 11, which is the information items and water board correspondence, any comments there? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I do have one comment on the, the write-up that was in the the packet related to the cash and lieu. Um, first off, I thought you guys did a really good job of it. It was very thorough and I thought you did a good job. Um, the comment I'd make though is, 
in the write-up, it's still written as if the Piesco trade, um, whether or not that could be made permanent or not is a question. And Ken, I believe that at our last meeting, you said that they cannot do that. They cannot make that a permanent trade. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And if um, if we weren't clear on that, we yeah, I apologize for that. It, they, no, I, I think you were clear. It's just not in the, the council communication. It's still in there as a question. OK. And I think it needs to be clear that that's not going to be a, a permanent agreement with the input you got from Piesco. And the reason I bring that up is I think that kind of frames, you know, part of the question of how much water does Longmont need to develop. If if we're if that's not going to be permanent, in my mind, that should not be part of Longmont's, you know, firm yield analysis as a water supply, because I don't think you can rely on that permanently. So in the where that leads me to is then in the write up, you talk about union reservoir pump back updates um, when you get project firm yield analysis. I think that's all really good information that in, in the write-up, it said that'll come back in 2022. I'm just kind of framing it that as we compare supply and demand, um, I think you need to you know take maybe Piesco yield out, and then we need to look at the Union Reservoir Pump Back Project and the two forms, as well as the Windy Gap Firming Project and any update you get from Northern on yield into account as we're comparing supply and demand. And then the last item that I'm gonna tie into Tom's comment is, you know, whether it's affordable housing and commercial, you know, incentives or attainable housing, anything we're doing in, in, in terms of incentives is going to impact that supply side. So I just want to frame it as, as this analysis comes back, we're going to have to look at both supply and demand um, and compare all those to make sure we're, you know, understanding the overall impact in terms of making sure we have adequate supply to the, for the build out of the city of Longmont. So um, anyway, the big picture is you guys did a good job on it. It just raises some questions that I know are going to have to be answered. And I just want to give a little bit of feedback on a few of the items I think really need to be kind of focused on as we, we try to answer that question. So anyway. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, Todd. And, and, and I appreciate that because we can continue. We are, Jason is looking, working on some cost estimates for the pump back pipeline, but we can look at all of that and make sure maybe even as part of the uh, attainable housing, um, all of that can be part of that conversation and should be. So we're clear on all of that. So right. awesome. Okay. Um, any other comments on that item? I don't see any. So it looks like we're on to item 12, items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings, cash and loo. So we'll officially um, review that next month. Is that correct, Ken? Yeah, we probably won't suggest any changes because we're taking the cash and lieu resolution on the eighth. So <laughs> okay, I doubt we'll change it one week later. But but That's we right. certainly still want to provide you any additional new information we have. You okay. know, especially CBT. That sounds good. And then we have the also in March we're going to have the water board annual report. Is that right? Okay, um, and then any other, it says discuss future water board agendas, any items that any board members have um, for consideration on a future agenda. And I'm not seeing any. So with that, unless anybody else has a, um, anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Um, Roger? You're muted, Roger. Sorry about that. Anyway, just to echo your comments, Doc. Ken, I thought you did a good job on that study session. Very thorough and I thought it was well understood. Now I wanna, Marcia, your comments were helpful too. I appreciated those. So I'm glad it went the way it did. That's all I got. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order here? I am not seeing any. So with that, I am gonna adjourn the water board meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>